Hi everyone, this is Mrs. G A, and today we're going to talk about maximum and minimum values. So first we're going to talk about um, some vocabulary in reference to different types of maximums and minimums. So let's say C is some value within the domain of f of x. So we would call f of C the absolute maximum if f of C is greater than f of x for all uh, values of x within the domain. And we would call it the absolute minimum if f of C is less than or equal to x, f of x for all of the x values within the domain. So when you see absolute maximum or minimum, it means it is the um, absolute highest or lowest point. There are no points that are higher or lower. Um, so just uh, some vocabulary to be aware of. Sometimes absolute maxes and mins are called global maxes or mins, which makes sense because you know globally means like the absolute highest or lowest. Um, for and the uh, max and minimum values can also be referred to as extreme values. Um, or extrema for um, the plural version. And it is really important to note that absolute maxes and mins can occur at um, endpoints within a domain. So if you have, you know, a, a closed interval, um, you can have an absolute or a maximum at the endpoint. Now, a relative max or min is when um, f of x is greater than or equal to, or sorry, f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x values near c, or for the relative minimums, um, it's when that value is less than all of the other ones for all x values near c. Um, so if you kind of zoomed in around c, it would be a maximum or a minimum. It would look like an absolute maximum if you zoomed in far enough. Um, so relative maxes and mins are sometimes called local maxes and mins. It's just another, you know, it means um, the same thing as relative. Um, and it is really important to note that relative maxes and mins cannot occur at endpoints. So they have to be um, kind of within your graph. Um, and when we say near C, what we mean is on some open interval containing C. Um, so again, there's no like specific definition for how close, but it will say near C. So looking at a picture of this graph, let's see if we can label um, all of the max and mins and determine what type they are. Um, so first thing I see here is that this is the absolute lowest y value of my entire graph, and it is on an endpoint, and that's okay. So we can call um, f of a, we could call that an absolute minimum. Now let's see if we can determine an absolute maximum. I see this is the highest y value of my graph, so I'd say f of d would be an absolute maximum. Um, but you can see that there are some other, uh, if you zoomed in, there's definitely other hills and valleys, which would be maxes and mins. So if you look here um, at f of b, we can see that like around this general area, it is definitely a high point, so we would call this a local or I'll say relative relative maximum. And you can see at f of c right here, that's definitely a low point, it's a valley, um, but it's not the absolute lowest point, so we'd call it a relative or local minimum. Now just notice I'm not including um, uh, f of e because this would be considered a relative minimum. Well, it's not an absolute minimum, and we don't include endpoints for relative um, maxes or mids. Um, so now we're going to talk about um, the extreme value theorem. So this theorem states that if f is continuous, so I'm going to highlight that, that is important, continuous on a closed interval, that's also important, um, and the closed interval a to b, then f attains an absolute maximum at f of c and an absolute minimum at f of d at some numbers um, within that interval. So essentially it's saying if these things are true, then there must be an absolute max and an absolute min, um, or at least one of each. Um, so if you look at this first graph, it is closed interval, it's continuous, and we can see that here we have an absolute max, and here we have an absolute min. Um, and then if you look at this um, next example, here would be our absolute max, and here would be our absolute min. It's okay that it's on an endpoint. Um, and then um, in this third graph, we actually have two 
absolute, well, two points where we have an absolute max. The absolute maximum value is the same. Um, f of c1 is equal to f of c2. Um, so we have two points that have an absolute maximum. And then um, f of d right here would be our absolute minimum. So you can see that all three of these graphs are, again, continuous and have that closed interval a to b. Now we're going to look at some times where that extreme value theorem wouldn't apply. Um, so that's when you have one of two things. Either it's not continuous or it's not a closed interval, meaning that we may not have an absolute max or min. So if you look at this um, first graph in part A, we actually do have an absolute minimum. Um, it would be right here. Um, but in this case, uh, what would be our highest point, you can see that our graph is not continuous. So for this one, we actually have no absolute maximum. And really, it's because it's not continuous over that open interval of 1 or 0 to 2, or that closed interval, sorry, of 0 to 2. Um, so in this case, we actually have no absolute maximum. You can see there's that jump discontinuity. Um, and then if you look at this next example, here our graph would be continuous over an open interval of um, 0 to 2, but remember it must be continuous over the closed interval. So it is not continuous over the closed interval 0 to 2. So you can see we have an open coordinate at, um, at x equals 0, and we have an asymptote that does not exist at um, x equals 2. So in this case, we would have um, no absolute max or min. So again, the exceptions to the extreme value theorem would be when it's um, not continuous over the closed interval or when it's not a closed interval. So now let's talk for a second about how um, our maxes and mins are related to the derivative. So let's look at this first example. We have uh, maybe a relative maximum here and a relative minimum here. So we know that at these um, times, at this time right here, our derivative is equal to zero. Um, because it's flattening out, the slope of our graph is equal to zero. Um, so we know that if we're looking for maxes and minimums, it might occur um, when the derivative is equal to zero. Now, I say it might occur because look at this next case, our absolute value graph. We can see that this is actually an absolute uh, minimum. However, we know that our derivative is actually undefined at this point because it comes to a point. So I'm not going to always say that it's when the derivative is equal to zero, but that is one thing to look for. It could also be when the derivative is undefined. Now these two kind of show you that those, those may not also be um, tell-alls. Like I'm not saying that if the derivative is zero that it is a max or min, because look at this case. Here, um, we could see at f of zero, um, the derivative is zero. Our graph does flatten out. It has a horizontal tangent line right here. Um, you could find the derivative of this. We know that f prime is 3x squared, so we could find f prime zero is zero. So we know that the slope of our tangent line at this point is zero. However, it is clearly not a minimum or max. It's not a local min or max is definitely not an absolute minimum or max. So the reason I point this out, because just because the derivative is zero doesn't necessarily mean it is a max or min. It's saying it might be a max or min. Um, and also, just because something, the derivative is undefined, doesn't al does not also absolutely mean that it's a max or min. If you look at this case of this graph, the cube root of x at x equals zero, we actually have that vertical tangent line, which is where our derivative is undefined. And this also is clearly not any type of max or min. So again, these are just things to look for with maxes or mins. Um, if the derivative is zero or if the derivative is undefined, it may be a max or min, but not all the time. Again, here the derivative is zero um, and it is not a max or min. Here our derivative is undefined and it is not a max or min. So those um, two scenarios that we just talked about in, on the last slide, um, these describe what are called critical points. So a critical point of a function is a number c in the domain of f such that um, f prime c, f prime of c is zero or f prime of c is undefined. So we're looking for when our derivative is equal to zero 
or undefined. Those are called critical points. Um, so now uh, we're going to talk about the steps to finding an absolute maximum or minimum on a closed interval. Um, so to find the absolute maximum, we're going to follow two steps and then our answer is somewhere um, within those two steps. So again, it must be a continuous function on a closed interval A to B. First thing we're going to do is find all of the critical numbers over um, that interval A to B. And then we're also going to find the values at the endpoints of our closed interval A and B. Um, and then we're going to look at those, the critical numbers and the values at the endpoints. And the largest values from steps one and two are, uh, the largest value is going to be the absolute maximum. And the smallest value is going to be the absolute minimum. So this is saying that the absolute maximum or minimum will either occur at those critical numbers or at the endpoints. All right, let's try this first example together. Uh, we're gonna sketch a graph of this function over this interval. Um, and then we're going to see if we can find the absolute extrema over the interval. Um, so first, it may be helpful for us to factor our function. Um, so we see that it's x squared times x minus 6. And this helps us determine our zeros. So we do have a 0 at the origin. And we have another 0 at positive 6. And then I'm going to just put, here's my endpoints at 10, and negative 1. And we'll find those values um, in just a moment. Um, and then another thing to point out is that this is a double root, has a multiplicity of 2, so we know that it actually touches and turns at this 0. So something to keep in mind. Um, so let's actually find, um, we'll start by finding f of negative 1. So we can plug it into our graph and we should get um, negative 7. So we can plot that point. Again, it's just an estimate, so maybe like right here. And then we would want to find our other endpoint, f of 10. Um, and that would give us 400. So again, this graph is definitely not drawn to scale. So it look like this. So how can I connect these dots and only cross at 0 and 6? Remember, it is important that we know what happens at a double root. Remember, it touches and turns. So it does something like this. Now, we're not exactly sure what's happening in between here. So I'm going to kind of leave this part blank for now, but we will fill it in. Um, and then I'm, we know that our graph is eventually going to do this. So again, the only thing we need to figure out is what's going on here. And we can, um, you know, finding our absolute or our critical numbers will definitely help with that. Um, so for the critical numbers, remember that's when our derivative is equal to zero or is undefined. So let's find those critical numbers. So first, our derivative is 3x squared minus 12x. Um, and then we set that equal to 0. Here we can factor like this. Um, so we see that we have um, two critical numbers at x equals 0 and at x equals 4. So we can see that 4 is a critical number. So that's going to tell us that you know, since our derivative is equal to 0, um, we are going to have a turning point. So we're going to want to figure out what f of 4 is. Um, we already know that f of 0 is 0, so that's already taken care of. Um, if you plug in 4 again into our original function, we get f of 4 is negative 32. So we actually see that that would be maybe way down here. Again, super not drawn to scale. Um, but we can label those points. So it does something like this. So this is 4, negative 32. This is negative 1, negative 7. And this is 10, 400. So again, super, super not drawn to scale. Um, so then remember, um, in that last slide, we learned that we check the endpoints and we check the values at the critical numbers. Oh, let me include 0, 0. Um, and the highest one will be our absolute max. So we can see that our absolute max is um, 400, and it occurs when x is 10. And our absolute min is negative 32, and that occurs when x is 4. And that's all we have to do. All right, let's try this next one together. 
Um, so here we have a rational function, and there's no way to simplify it. We definitely don't have any holes in this function. And actually, if you look for vertical asymptotes, our denominator will never equal zero. Um, you can try, and then you get x squared equals negative one. That won't give us real numbers. So there's actually no, um, no vertical asymptotes for this one which are really, of course, common for these types of functions. And then if you compare um, the degree of the numerator to the denominator, we see that we have a horizontal asymptote, ha, at y equals zero. So you can kind of sketch that in if it helps you. Um, but then we do have those endpoints of our graph. Um, so we can plug in some values there. We can plug in f of negative two, and you should get negative four fifths. Um, and then, so that would be, let's just say, here's negative 2, and here's positive 2. So it'd be maybe here. And then you can plug in f of positive 2, our other endpoint, and that um, gives us positive 4 fifths. So I'll plot that maybe somewhere right around here. Okay, so now um, we need to find our critical numbers. So we need to find critical numbers um, using our derivative. So let's take the derivative here. Um, here we will need to use our quotient rule. So low d high minus high d low all over low low. And we can simplify that out a little bit. So 2x squared plus 2 minus 4x squared. So um, we could say negative, we'll have negative 2x squared plus 2. So we could say negative 2 times x squared minus 1, which we can factor out a little bit more to help us find those critical points. Okay, um, so we can see that um, this will never be undefined. Um, our derivative will never be undefined. The only time it might be undefined is if the denominator is equal zero. This, it will never equal zero, um, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, and so we know that the only critical points that we might have are when our derivative is equal to zero. Um, so if we substitute zero for our derivative, a fraction is equal to zero when the numerator is equal to zero. So we're essentially just setting our numerator equal to zero. So I can see that we have two critical numbers at um, plus or minus one. So we will want to find the values at those critical numbers. So if you plug in one to our original function, we get one. And if you plug in negative 1 to our original function, we actually get negative 1. Um, so that would be, so here's negative 1, here's positive 1. And we know that um, 1 is higher than 4 fifths by a little bit. So it, relatively, it should be higher. And negative 1 is a little lower than negative 4 fifths. Um, we can also um, determine that our graph will go through the origin. Because for our original function, if you... Um, if we're finding our zeros, uh, you set the numerator equal to zero and it is zero. Um, so our graph must look something like this. Again, this is negative one, negative one, and one, one. So if you look at the values um, from our endpoints and our critical numbers, again, we're just looking at the y values here, we can see that our absolute maximum is one and our absolute minimum is negative one. So we could write those out, absolute max equals 1 when x is equal to 1, and absolute min is negative 1 when x is negative 1. And there's our answer. All right, let's try one last one together. So here we have the function sine squared of x. So let's start by plugging in our endpoints. So we'll start by finding f of negative um, pi over 4. So we ha we're essentially doing the sine of negative pi over 4 
um, squared. So negative root 2 over 2 squared is actually positive 1 half. Um, so let's say that that's right here. And here's um, 5 pi over 4. Um, so this value would be, uh, let's say right here. And f of 5 pi over 4. So again, the sine of 5 pi over 4 squared. So it's actually the same thing. It actually ends up equaling 1 half. So right here. Um, so now we need to find the critical numbers, which is where a derivative is undefined or 0. Um, so to find this derivative, we are going to need to use our um, chain rule. Um, so for this one, uh, we have 2 times the sine of x, so that's um, taking the derivative of something being squared, and then we're going to take the derivative of our inner function. The derivative of sine is cosine. Um, so we have 2 sine of x cosine of x, which actually is our, um, uh, it is equal to sine of 2x. That's our double angle formula. Um, so it does help to rewrite it like this because, again, we're trying to see when this is undefined or equal to 0. So I can see that this is never going to be undefined. So f prime of x is never undefined because we know um, the domain of all real numbers is or of sine is all real numbers. So we really are going to look for when our derivative is equal to 0. So when is the sine of 2x equal to 0? Um, so we know that um, sine is equal to 0 at um, 0 and pi and 2 pi, um, so on and so forth. So we could say 2x is equal to pi n, which essentially means any, um, any uh, integer multiple of pi. So 0 times pi, 1 times pi, 2 times pi, um, negative 1 times pi. But we do need to finish solving for x, so we need to actually divide by 2. So it's going, um, our derivative is equal to 0 um, at um, any multiple of pi over 2. So within our closed interval, that's going to be at 0, pi over 2, and pi. Um, so we actually do need to now go find those values from our original function. So we can do f of 0, we know sine of 0 is 0, um, and then you square that and that's equal to 0. So we have the point 0, 0, and let's say here's pi over 2, and here's pi. Um, so if we do f of pi over 2, we know that the sine of pi over 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1. So we have 0, 1, or sorry, pi over 2, 1. So here's 1, and here's 1 half. And then we need to find f of pi, which again is 0. So we're back to here. So we see that our graph looks like this. Oops. And again, it's not really drawn to scale, um, but we do have all the information um, that we need um, to help us determine our absolute max and min. So we can see that our absolute maximum is here, and we actually have two points that give us that absolute minimum. Um, so we have an absolute max is 1, um, and that occurs when x equals pi over 2. Um, and then we have an absolute minimum at 0, and that occurs at 2 times when x is 0 and um, pi. So those are the answers. All right, so that is all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching.